I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, first annual William Dolan Lecture Series. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce His Excellency, the Bishop of Arlington, Bishop John Richard Keating. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father of us all, we have come together today to ask your blessing upon those who dedicate their lives to the godly work of healing us in body and soul. Bless the staff here at Arlington Hospital. Bless Dr. Fauci and his remarkable work on behalf of your family. Bless Dr. William Dolan and his family. Dr. Dolan, who for more than four decades has served you in your suffering sons and daughters. From the loneliness of a laboratory to the drama of an emergency room, from the miracle of a delivery room to the grief of the bereaved, Dr. Dolan has been a beacon of your hope a dispenser of your mercy and consolation, the faithful steward of your precious gift of life to us in this community. In caring for the frailty of the human body, he has never failed to promote the nobility of the human spirit and the dignity of human life in its every stage and status. This, O oh Heavenly Father, has been your gift to him. He, in turn, has been your gift to us. Bless all of us, Father, with your continued protection and guidance as we praise you and thank you forever and ever. I have the pleasure of making a few introductory remarks about this event and the effort. The Hazel boys, Till and Bill Hazel, who many of you know, uh, came in the winter of 1987 and said it's time that uh, you folks did something to honor Bill Dolan. And as the Hazel boys are known, they had an idea, and they put their funds where their mouth is. And they came up with a sizable uh, piece of change to help to get this effort started. And their, their suggestion was that we go and match the money. Well, there was no specific project in mind, so Judy Fox, God love her, who was the uh, Vice President for the Development of the Foundation, and I took to the road uh, having lunch, having a drink, just having a visit with people who knew Bill Dolan over the years. And I must say that that was one of the more pleasant roads I've had the privilege of traveling. From person to person, we met people whose lives were touched by this man and who were so willing to share their experiences with us and then give us names of other people whose lives had been touched by Bill Dolan. The people who we spoke to were unanimous in, in many things. One, this fellow was the consummate physician. Although his specialty was pathology, he was ever available to counsel fellow physicians, counsel patients, help the bereaved, in fact, when it was unheard of, one of our contacts told us that 30 years ago, he said in his own inimitable fashion, explicative, explicative, we're not going to have that done, let's go get a second opinion. And that individual and his wife uh, produced two beautiful sons after that. And that individual will never forget Bill Dolan. Months passed by. We were doing very well raising funds. This was a, uh, 
an amazing experience. Uh, people are very generous and to do anything to help the memory of Bill Dolan and to uh, help Arlington Hospital at the same time. People gave because they were honoring Bill Dolan. But we still didn't have a project. And we thought of bricks and mortar, and we thought of a, of a lot of possibilities. But we appointed a committee. We asked to serve on the committee Dr. Bob Ryan, Dr. Uh, uh, Don Nolan, Dr. Larry Gatos, and Judy Fox and myself. We had many meetings, some uh, long meetings, uh, some short ones. And the, the same thing kept reappearing all the time in the conversations. Was, this man's biggest contribution, uh, other than his care of patients, was to the educational process here in Arlington Hospital. The Georgetown affiliation was a very strong thing for Bill Dolan. He was in when it started, and it would not be in existence today if, unless he individually had not constantly worked to keep it, to expand it, to make it a greater thing. So we decided that we would have something to do with education. And we met, and I had to ask for suggestions as to what, you know, what would be the best suggestion from each one of them. And very briefly, I just wanted to give you my recollection of what it was. Uh, Bob Ryan said, we need a national figure in medicine, a doctor who would command the respect of the medical world. Dr. Nolan, he said, a person with strong academic credentials someone on the cutting edge in the daily battle to conquer diseases. Larry Gato said, an individual who has a reputation and accomplish accomplishments that will make the Arlington medical community continue to recognize Arlington Hospital as the center of medical education in our area. Judy Fox says, let's be sure to get a lecturer who will turn out a strong representation of the medical people we are, after all, honoring Dr. Dolan, one of them. And I had my two cents, and I said, let's get a guy from Brooklyn who went to Holy Cross. <laughs> it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Ryan, who is president of the medical staff here at the Arlington Hospital. Bob? Okay, thank you, Ken. I want to welcome all of you here tonight, in particular, members of the Board of Trustees, members of the medical staff, friends of Bill Dolan, which is the same to say friends of Arlington Hospital. Basically, I just have a very short message, and mostly it's to say that for us, this is a very thrilling experience. I mean, we have known Bill as an educator over the years. Certainly, he's the one who established the affiliation with Georgetown University, the Friday conferences, and, and one after the other, one way or another, showing us the way. And so it's a thrill to be here to experience this with him and to know that this is going to go on, that all the good things he has done and the, the way he tried to show us will continue after us. And we'll be here many years, we hope, to partake of this. The contributors, many of whom are here tonight, I mean, certainly know that this is an investment that's probably the best one you've ever made. And it comes back to all of us, not only in learning new things and in the uh, pleasure and privilege of hearing state-of-the-art speakers every year, but then it helps us in taking care of our patients and taking care of your families and friends and so forth. So primarily, I want to say that we're thrilled to be here, and we're very grateful and thankful to all of you who helped make this thing come about, who contributed to it, and will help it go on over the years. And most of all, to Bill himself, we would say thank you. This is a wonderful evening. It's a very special moment, I think, for all of us. It's my privilege on behalf of the medical staff to share in this tribute to a very special person, Dr. Dolan, Dr. William D. Dolan. As a young man, Dr. Dolan was attracted to athletics. This may explain his intensity of effort, his competitive spirit, and his will to win. 
As an undergraduate, Dr. Dolan excelled in sports. He established a 100-yard dash record that stood for several decades and earned him an honored place in the Rhode Island University Sports Hall of Fame. He was a catcher on the baseball team. What a perfect position for him. <laughs> Who would ever try to cross home plate with him standing there? He graduated from Georgetown University School of Medicine, entered the Army in the midst of World War II, and landed on the beaches of France via an amphibious craft. Shortly after he arrived, Hitler surrendered. <laughs> <laughs> now the Germans must have known something. He completed his residency in pathology. He assumed the directorship of the pathology department at Arlington in 1947, and the hospital was just a few years old. In those days, the hospital was truly operating on a limited budget. The money that was collected in the morning from the discharged patient was taken to the market at noon to buy the food to feed the inpatients for that evening. The only air conditioner was provided by a huge fan blowing across several blocks of ice in the operating room, provided by a grateful patient of Dr. Hazel's. From the moment that Dr. Dolan arrived, though, changes began to take place. His career has been intimately intertwined with the history of this hospital and with the history of this community. With a keen sense of the future, he had the wisdom to see the value of a university affiliation, and in 1948, he became the driving force that established a teaching affiliation between Georgetown University and this hospital. It was one of the first established in this country. Today, 40 years later, it's the dream of every community hospital to affiliate with a major university. He was ahead of his time. How fortunate for all of us. He fought the town and gown syndrome, and he won. He fought for the private practice of medicine, and he won. He fought for quality care, and he won. Has he ever lost? Before anyone knew the meaning of CME, he had begun regular conferences for the attending staff, always an innovator ahead of his time. Even now, at his young age, he has become the local authority on AIDS. And it's appropriate that Dr. Fauci is here to speak on that subject this evening. In his community, he, had, he devoted his time to the police, the fire departments, the health departments, the courts. He's, this is all well known. On the national level, he's been active in the American Medical Association. And of particular note, he served on the prestigious policy-setting scientific council for many years. He was active with the American Society of Clinical Pathology, serving as its national president and pioneered quality control laboratories, improving blood banking techniques and promoting certification and continuing education for laboratory technicians. His laboratory at this hospital became the gold standard by which others were judged. I used to wonder, though, why so many of his staff re uh, members remained with him for so long. The years of unemployment in his laboratory would stretch beyond eternity. I discovered later that this fierce loyalty is nothing more than an expression of love, and his loyalty and devotion to them is reciprocal. He has a face over which uh, an insightful artist a few years ago drew the map of Ireland, and probably that says it all. He expresses his strong feelings of caring by always striving for excellence and with an unlagging loyalty to family, to friends, to staff, to hospital, to church, and community. For over 40 years, he's been a leader at every level for quality medical care. We feel very fortunate to have been with you, at least for part of this time, Bill. You have carried us on your coattail. It's been a wonderful ride. It's been a whirlwind. It's been a tornado. And because of our feeling for you and in gratitude for the countless contributions you've made to our hospital and this community, this lectureship has been established by your family and your friends in appreciation to honor you and to say, thank you, Bill Dolan. We love you.
I think it was Bob Hope who, after an introduction like this, said, I just can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> I want to recognize the people who are so kind to come to this. I hope you'll all have the pleasure of sitting in the front seat like I just did there for a few minutes and listen to all these lies. Uh, <laughs> hold your head down. I appreciate uh, Dr. Hegarty putting this together. I'm, I'm pleased and honored by it all, obviously. I'm uh, pleased on behalf of my family that's here, all except my daughter, Mary Ann, who's marooned on Nantucket Island and thought she better stay there rather than try to come back tonight. I'm pleased on behalf of my colleagues over these many years without whom this hospital certainly would not have flourished. I'm pleased on behalf of the thousands who have worked with me in the hospital, particularly in the Department of Pathology, many of whom are still here. One's here after 38 years. She has great patience. <laughs> I'm pleased that uh, the dean from Georgetown, I hope he's here. I did not see him come in. There he is. Uh, he uh, is kind of shy, staying in the back, who has been a great supporter, as have his predecessors, in maintaining the affiliation uh, uh, with Arlington, which has meant so much to us. Ken Hegarty didn't say that without uh, his support, without his leadership, uh, there would be no scholarship program to bring speakers here as we have tonight. I would be remiss if I didn't echo the re remarks of the Hazel family, under whose roof we have the privilege of meeting here in this Hazel Auditorium. They were the ones who initiated the fundraising fundraise for this uh, uh, auditorium as well as for the uh, scholarship uh, program which we've you've heard about. The value of a program like this will be manifest long after I'm gone. And several remarks that uh, went through with this uh, introductions uh, could almost be uh, in uh, memorial to this fellow. Huh? <laughs> I came in with my white coat on to show that I was still working, but my wife persuaded me that I, I better go back for two reasons. First, to show that I had a coat, and uh, sec secondly, that, uh, that I'm still working here. I'm pleased to see many of my friends, including Dr. George Lundberg, the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association, who put himself out to uh, come and visit with us uh, uh, here tonight. The speaker that has been chosen is very appropriate. The topic is uh, appropriate. He is particularly appropriate because he's uh, one of the outstanding researchers. You don't have to wait for us to tell you that. He's on the front page of the Washington Post, front page of the Washington uh, Times. He even has a well-known speaker mention him in a national uh, hookup, national uh, address. The current president-elect of the uh, United States chose to mention him in his uh, speech here two or three weeks ago. He also has uh, one other thing that's not to emphasize so much in, in the uh, publicity on AIDS. He had the good wisdom uh, to marry an Irishman, Christine Grady. <laughs> All of this is in the program, which you had the opportunity to read. He had taken time from his busy schedule to come to Arlington, prompted by many 
in this audience, including the Dean, Dean Kahn. And uh, we here are very honored and we appreciate the fact that he goes from here on to uh, uh, another commitment. And I'm glad that uh, we're not as late as I thought we uh, would be. Dr. Fauci, we welcome you to Arlington Hospital. Thank you very much, Dr. Dolan, and congratulations on this lecture series. And it's a great honor for me to be here with you this evening uh, to launch this series as the first William D. Dolan lectureship, lectureship. What I'd like to do this evening is discuss with you several areas of, uh, of the AIDS epidemic. If I were to pick out any of the areas that I'm talking about, I probably could spend 45 minutes on each of them. But what I decided to do was to focus on several empiric areas in, in the AIDS epidemic and discuss particular aspects of it that are interesting, currently changing, or even uh, are mixed with some controversy. So what I'll do is just, let's see. Um, first thing I'm going to do is bring the screen down, I guess. There you go. I've broken down the uh, lists of of areas that we'll be discussing into five empiric areas. Uh, epidemiology and natural history, the etiologic agent, pathogenesis, antiretroviral therapy, and vaccine development and evaluation. And as I mentioned, I'd like to just go very quickly through these and focus on areas that I think of will be of particular interest to you. Now, when one thinks of the epidemiology and natural history, at least from the standpoint of the NIH, where, where I do my research and, and, and administer the, the, uh, the program for AIDS, that the NIH would really not have much interest in epidemiology and natural history since it's an institute uh, of, uh, of basic and clinical biomedical research. But in fact, what we've learned from observing the natural history of this epidemic has had an extraordinary impact on how we look at pathogenic mechanisms of how we make projections uh, for feasibility of vaccine development and testing or what have you. So let me very briefly bring you up to date on where we are and some of the dilemmas even now in 1988 in fully understanding the nature of the epidemiology and natural history. This is a slide breaking down the numbers of patients, adults and adolescents with AIDS as of a week and a half ago, November the 7th, two weeks ago, November the 7th, 1988. As you can see, there are now approximately 76,000 individuals with full-blown AIDS. And the breakdown is interesting because I update this slide about every two or three weeks. And the relative proportion of individuals in these different categories, which we call risk groups, which in many respects is inappropriate since you shouldn't call them risk groups since they're really people with risk behaviors and has nothing to do with the group has remained relatively constant, the relative proportion, with some modest changes that I'll allude to in a moment. As you can see, 62% of individuals are homosexual or bisexual men, 20% are IV drug abusers, 7% are both uh, gay men and IV drug abusers, 1% hemophiliac or coagulation disorder, 4% heterosexual contact. Now, this is the line that gets everyone concerned because they feel that this would be a reflection of the chances of this epidemic going into the general population, as it were. And I'll get back to this heterosexual contact in a moment. 3% transfusions with blood or blood products and 3% uh, undetermined. If one looks at the pediatric population, there are now about 12 to 1,300 reported cases in children infants and children. However, this is very likely a gross underestimate of the number of children who are infected and who also have some degree of compromise of their health. Certainly there are thousands of infants and children who are infected with no symptoms, but there are certainly more than 1,200 who have serious disease. And the reason for that is that the criteria for diagnosing AIDS in children is much less precise than the empiric criteria that we have established now with the CDC's and the Walter Reed's definition 
uh, of full-blown AIDS. An interesting point on this slide is that of these children with AIDS, 78% of them have a parent with AIDS or at risk for AIDS. This is extraordinarily important in our understanding really where this epidemic is now going in this country. In other words, these individuals are very likely individuals whose parent is an IV drug abuser or the sexual partner of an IV drug abuser. Also, this explains the disproportionate number of children with AIDS or who are minorities, blacks and Hispanics, because of the disproportionate number of blacks and Hispanics in the IV drug abusing population. And we'll also be learning a little bit about the potential heterosexual spread when one looks at the numbers with regard to children. Now, you often hear epidemiologists talk about the iceberg of HIV infection. Uh, in fact, what we're referring to is the fact that this tip of the iceberg, full-blown AIDS, represents the 76 or 77,000 individuals who have full-blown disease. And we know, and, and I, I'm certain that these projections are correct, that there are at least one to one and a half million people in this country who are infected with HIV who are essentially asymptomatic. And the critical question is, and it's something we don't have a precise answer to, and that is what percentage of individuals who are infected and asymptomatic at the present time are going to go on to develop full-blown AIDS. And the confusion that you hear about and read about in the newspapers and see on television and listen to in the radio is due to the fact that there is mixing up of hard data with projections from hard data. On this slide, in the closed circles is the hard data. In the open circles are possible projections of that hard data. Let me explain what I mean. We know now that within a period of approximately four to five years, at least 30% of individuals who are HIV infected will develop what we now call full-blown AIDS, and another 12, 15 or so percent will develop symptoms strongly suggestive of going on to full-blown AIDS. What we don't know is what's going to happen 20, 30, and 40 years, barring effective therapy, and we'll get back to that in a moment. In other words, if you wait long enough, is everyone who is infected with HIV ultimately going to wind up developing AIDS? Now, if we put aside therapy for a moment, there are data from the Walter Reed Army Medical Center which are somewhat depressing in this regard. Because if you look at individuals who are infected with HIV and don't ask whether they have symptoms or not symptoms, but if you just follow their immunological status, you will find that up to 85 or 90 percent of individuals within three to four years will develop some sort of deterioration of their immunological function even though they remain completely asymptomatic, which is telling you that although within a five-year period individuals are not necessarily getting sick, certainly there's a negative or deleterious effect on their immune system, which strongly suggests that if that is progressive, sooner or later, barring effective therapy, virtually everyone is going on to develop full-blown disease. And that's something that has important implications when you think of the impotence of doing studies and in early intervention of therapy. And I'll, again, I'll get back to that in a moment. Now, with regard to these projections, we know now that by the end of 1992, there will have been 365 cumulative cases of AIDS diagnosed and 263 cumulative deaths. In 1992, there will be more new cases of AIDS, 80,000, than there have been since the beginning of the AIDS epidemic was recognized in 1981 till now, the end of 1988. And there will be 66,000 deaths alone in 1992. Now, you may have remembered some time ago, there was some argument about whether these projections were not really realistic or true. And the fact is, if you go back and you analyze the data and you look at the numbers of people who've developed AIDS up to now, based on the percentage who will develop AIDS who are initially infected, it falls right within the line of the curve that the CDC had projected. So those numbers of one to one and a half million infected and those projections 
of 365,000 are very likely to be right on the mark. Now this slide outlines the prevalence of HIV seropositivity in the United States and again sources of great confusion and the reason why you have people who go from one end of the spectrum to the other saying it's not going to be a problem in the general population to people who say it's going to be a devastating problem. Essentially the opposites of the extreme, the Cosmopolitan article versus the Masters and Johnson report. If you read it, it's rather schizophrenic to read each of those because they come to opposite conclusions. Let's look at the data. With regard to homosexual and bisexual men, depending on the city that you look at, the percentage of individuals who are infected with HIV will vary from as low as 10 or 20 percent in some cities to as high as 50 to 70 percent in other cities. If you look at IV drug abusers, again, if you're an IV drug abuser in Des Moines, Iowa, the chances of your being infected are very low, probably less than 5 percent. If you're an IV drug abuser in Newark, New Jersey, in the South Bronx, or in Miami, the chances are very, very high. Spouses of infected male, again, a very fascinating uh, situation. If you look at the wives or women sexual partners of hemophiliacs who are infected, from whom you can culture the virus, but who are really well, the chances of getting infected from a man to a woman is very, very low. It increases as individuals become antigenemic and get more ill. But if you have an asymptomatic person, it's very low. In fact, recent papers indicate that one in over a thousand sexual contacts will transmit the virus. And we know from all sexually transmitted diseases that it is more difficult for a woman to give it to a man than a man to give it to a woman. But from what we know from the situation in Africa, we know that clearly the virus can be transmitted both ways, men to women, women to men, vaginal intercourse, rectal intercourse, or what have you. Why is there such a low level of transmissibility? We don't know the answer. The reasons we give are that there are cofactors, other sexually transmitted diseases, degree of, of viremia, uh, a variety of other potential cofactors, but it still is unclear. Complacency based on that, I think, will be a disaster. In other words, if the general population feels since the transmissibility in the general population is so low that there's nothing to worry about. And I, that, I think that's really going to be a problem uh, if people get complacent about that. The blood donor pool is a reflection of individuals in this country excluding uh, male homosexuals and IV drug abusers because for the most part they voluntarily refrain from giving blood. If you look at that, the, the percentage of individuals infected is less than 0.03%. Military recruits is very interesting. It's at least five times that in the general population. Now, of all military recruits, 0.15% of them are infected. But we get clues about where the epidemic is going when you look at the military recruits. Because if you come from a high-risk city where there are high IV drug abusers, you have a very good chance of being infected. In other words, the total pool of hundreds of thousands of recruits is 0.15% infected. If you're a white woman from the Plains states in the United States, the chances are one in several thousand that you're infected. If you're a young black man in Manhattan, the chances are one in 50 that you'll be infected. And that is very likely due to the fact that there is probably secondary spread from around IV drug abusing communities such that an individual who might not necessarily be an IV drug abuser will have a number of sexual contacts with individuals who are IV drug abusers. They, the pattern follows very clearly. The heterosexual pattern and the pediatric pattern. And in fact, if you look at this slide, which summarizes data from a surveillance of HIV positivity in newborn infants in New York State, it again confirms that epidemiological profile that centers around the IV drug abusing population. They screened approximately 20,000 infants in New York State and they found that 1 in 117 were positive statewide, but look at New York City. 1 in 61 newborn infants were positive in New York City as a whole. 1 in 43 in the Bronx. 1 in 51 in Manhattan 
one in 58 in Brooklyn, one in 124 in the Queens, and one in 131 in Staten Island. Now, for any of you, like myself, who grew up in New York City, this looks like a increasing proportion of the number of trees in a borough in Brooklyn versus Manhattan versus Queens, where you have the least here in the Bronx and the most here in Staten Island. What it really is, is the relative proportion of IV drug abuse in those, in those uh, communities. So the, the infants who are infected are, in, are in getting infected from mothers who are either IV drug abusers or the sexual partners of IV drug abusers. And that's exactly what this data and the military recruit data indicates. So the problem of IV drug abuse becomes a major problem in this country. Now, what to do about that is obviously something that is, is, is very difficult uh, uh, to approach. We'll get into that when we talk a little bit uh, about some of, the, uh, of, of some of the treatment protocols. Now, since this is a hospital that sees patients and patients who are HIV infected, I think it's important to point out the question that I always get asked is what about this healthcare worker danger of getting infected? Well, we know now that there have been a number of individuals who have been exposed occupationally and who have actually gotten infected. This is an outline of individuals without documentation of seroconversion. In other words, individuals who were exposed who we didn't have a serum sample before they were exposed who ultimately wound up getting uh, infected or, 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 or converting their antibody test. And as you can see, a number of individuals, predominantly needle stick and mucosal splashes. There are seven of them. There are 15 individuals who have documented exposures, mostly needle sticks. This is eight on this slide and another seven here for 15 individuals who have now converted to antibody positivity. Now, these data, in fact, confirm that the virus is not spread by casual contact because in every one of these cases, there was a significant exposure predominantly through a needle stick. If you look at all the thousands of needle sticks in this country on, from individuals who are known to be infected with HIV, the chance of converting is less than a half a percent, 0.42 percent. Now, that's obviously too much. You'd like it to be 0 percent. But if you look and compare it to hepatitis B, in which on any given exposure, the chances are 26 percent that you'll get infected with hepatitis B. The chances of getting infected with HIV are very low in this regard. Nonetheless, very low is not good enough. So when we talk to our people at the NIH and elsewhere, it is very, very clear that care has to be taken in handling of blood with particular attention not to putting so many garments on you that, on you that you're going to wind up sticking yourself at an even greater rate, but to pay attention to very simple things like not resheathing needles, which is one of the main causes of uh, finger stick uh, injuries uh, in uh, healthcare workers. Let me move on now to the etiologic agent in an area which I have spent most of my uh, research endeavors over the past several years in the etiologic agent and uh, the pathogenesis. The AIDS virus is a virus of the retrovirus family of the lentivirus subgroup, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. This is an electron micrograph of the virus budding off a target CD4 positive T cell. In other words, a cell that has a marker that happens to be the receptor for the virus. And I'll get back to that in a moment. This is a typical electron micrographic appearance uh, of this retrovirus. Now, a retrovirus is an interesting virus. Prior to the discovery of HTLV-1, which is the cause of adult T-cell leukemia and lymphoma, no known retroviruses infected man. We know a lot about retroviruses from work on animals. And, I, and again, I would like to emphasize, as I always do, that the fundamental research that had been going on for years prior to the AIDS epidemic is the reason why we had been able to make such rapid advances since the realization that we were dealing with a new syndrome. So basic undifferentiated research, as we have been saying for so many years, is the reason why we now have such practical applications for it, particularly in our ability uh, to combat this dread disease. 
A retrovirus is called a retrovirus because it does its replication in a retrograde fashion. For a virus to multiply and propagate itself, it generally has to take over the, gene the genetic material of the cell that it infects. And it does that by essentially inserting itself into the genome of a cell. Now, since the AIDS virus is an RNA virus, and we know that DNA is capable of directing uh, uh, the genomic material of a cell, this virus has to get itself into a form of DNA called a provirus. And what it does is that it binds to this molecule, which is the receptor on the surface, and the RNA is essentially shot into the cell. And by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, because most of the time transcription is from DNA to RNA, when you have reverse transcription, you go from RNA to DNA. So this RNA is going to make a DNA copy of itself, which is ultimately going to be integrated or inserted into the genome of the cell itself. And it could stay there indefinitely. And when we talk about latency in a minute, I'll explain what we mean by that. It can really just sit there forever. Or by an activation signal, it can be triggered to express itself either as genomic and or messenger RNA, protein synthesis, assembly of virions, and budding. So it goes in as an RNA virus. It becomes DNA. It either sits there or gets activated to become an RNA virus, and then it buds off. That's how the virus works. Now, what we've learned in the last few years since the discovery of the AIDS virus about the genetic makeup of this has been most extraordinary and has been really very exciting to be involved in this area of research. I don't expect any of you not familiar with this to understand all of this on the slide, so why don't we just talk in general terms. This is what we call a genomic map of HIV. What that means is that investigators have been able to map out the different genes of this virus, to sequence those genes completely to the point where we can tell you all the building blocks of a given strain, the genetic building blocks, the nucleotide sequences. There are three structural genes that code for various structures on the virus, and there are six very, very important regulatory genes because they regulate the ability of this virus to multiply, to stay latent, to take over the, the, the functions of a cell, or to even modulate some of those cellular functions. Studying uh, the regulatory elements of the HIV has caused us to have extraordinary insight into how viruses interact with cells and vice versa. Let me point out just two of these genes, the TAT gene and the NEF gene, which upregulate and downregulate viral expression. And also, this particular part here, which we'll get to in a moment, which is responsible, is called the LTR for the long terminal repeat, for inducing the expression of virus. And manipulation of these genes will allow us in the future to control the expression of the virus. Now, what about HIV-2? You've heard a lot about HIV-2. HIV-2 is a relative of HIV-1. It's more closely related to the simian immunodeficiency virus, SIV, than HIV-1 is. It's different in that it has different structural components, particularly around the area of the envelope. Now, all this tells you, again, I don't expect all of you to understand this, and I won't dwell on the specifics of it, but if you take a, a, a lysate of HIV-2 and compare it with HIV-1 and do a serum sample on a blot from an individual with HIV-2, you see this HIV-2 individual recognizes the components of the HIV-2 but only recognizes one of the components of HIV-1. The outer coating or the envelope is not recognized, so there's very little cross-reactivity at that one particular structure uh, of the virus. Now, you know there's a big scare, there had been a big scare, is HIV in this country, and if it is, are we missing it in the blood uh, pool? Are, are blood transfusions getting through that have HIV-2? This is extraordinarily unlikely because in screening thousands of blood donors, there was not one single confirmed antibody positive HIV-2. There was one case of HIV-2 AIDS in the United States diagnosed in New Jersey in December of 1987 from a West African patient 
who almost certainly got it when she was in West Africa. And currently, there is now developing uh, ELISAs in Western blots that will be able to determine both HIV-1 and HIV-2. So although this is something we should be alert to, because just like HIV-2 is becoming more prominent in Western Europe, and now most recently in Brazil, the reason we know that if you look at the map, you can see how close Western Africa is to Brazil, and a lot of communication back and forth there, I'm certain that we're going to be seeing cases of HIV-2 AIDS in the future. Let's move on to pathogenesis. I think one of the most exciting areas uh, of the study of HIV. This is a blow up of the AIDS virus, a schematic diagram. And these are some of the, the components that I was talking about. Remember I mentioned structural genes. Well, one of the structural genes is the envelope gene, which codes for this outer coding of the AIDS virus. We designate it by names that tend to confuse people, but that's the way scientists usually work. They confuse people not to mention themselves. They, you must have read about GP160 and GP41. That really stands for our glycoprotein of a molecular weight of 120,000. This is the predominant binding component of the virus to the cell. Now, for reasons that we don't understand, this particular outer component of the virus is able to bind with extraordinary avidity to a molecule on the surface of one of the most important cells in our immune system, the CD4 positive lymphocyte. Now, any cell that has that molecule on its surface is capable of having the virus bind to it. Certain cells, like the monocyte, have it also, and we'll get that into that in a moment. But the critical cell in the immunopathogenesis of HIV infection is the T4 lymphocyte, and I'll explain why that's the case in a moment. Now, why a virus in its evolutionary pattern would develop an outer coating that specifically binds to a particular type of cell in man obviously eludes us. But if you look at the history of viruses and the uncanny ways they evolved themselves to be able to attack and live in host organisms, it really isn't surprising that this virus has able to do that. Unfortunately, the ultimate effect of it is devastating. And I'll show you in a moment. This T4 lymphocyte, which is the premier target of HIV, is a cell that's responsible for inducing the functions of virtually every other cell in the immune system. Now, you all know that the common denominator in AIDS is you lose your ability to protect yourself against infections in certain tumors. Your immune system is devastated. Now, I'm telling you that the virus selectively and specifically infects one kind of cell, namely the T4 cell. We'll get to the monocyte in a moment. Yet, if you look in the literature, virtually every immunological abnormality imaginable has been reported with HIV infection. That's somewhat of a paradox. Here's this guy telling me that the virus infects one particular cell, and yet the whole immune system falls apart. The reason is that the whole immune system, to a greater or lesser degree, depends upon this T4 cell to induce it. So that if you eliminate this cell, all of these other cells do not function normally. And the result, as I mentioned, is truly devastating, because the body is completely defenseless against opportunistic infections. Now, two major scenario can occur when there's infection with HIV. The first is that there's active productive infection and the virus reproduces itself and immediately kills the cell. Another is an area, in fact, that my own laboratory has been working on for the past several years, is latency or chronicity of infection, where the virus is in the cell but it isn't actively expressing itself. And only with a variety of activation signals do you have this latently infected cell become fully expressing of the virus. It's important to point out that there's confusion when people use the word latency. They interchangeably use clinical latency with microbiological latency. If someone is infected today, the mean time before that individual develops disease is over seven years. That's considered clinical latency. But during that period of time, 
there's a lot of activity of production of virus. So you may not have microbiological latency, although an individual can go for years being asymptomatic. What we're going to talk about is microbiological latency in a moment. This is an electron micrograph of virions literally exploding out of a cell that's been activated. That's the well-accepted mechanism whereby a cell is killed. Namely, they come to the surface, the virions, they butt off, and then you have this destruction of the cell. If you look at patterns that measure lymphocytes in individuals, you see this is a normal individual. This is a fluorescinated activated cell sorter analysis looking at subpopulations of lymphocytes. This little blip means that there's about 58 or 60 percent of this individual's T cells are the T4 lymphocyte. The cell that I mentioned to you was the target for HIV infection. This patient with AIDS has about 10 or 12 percent T4 cells. Namely, he's had a quantitative diminution of his T4 cells to the point that he's in very grave danger now of getting an opportunistic infection. And in fact, he did and ultimately succumbed to it. Now, in addition to quantitative abnormalities of lymphocytes, there are also significant functional abnormalities. Now, this gets a little bit complex. So rather than show you any data, I've drawn some, I've drawn some schematic diagrams to explain how, in a very, very subtle and sophisticated way, the virus can block the function of your lymphocytes. Whenever we respond to a particular stimulus, it is due to cells coming together in a very delicate fit to initiate the immune response. If we get exposed to an antigen, whatever that antigen might, might be, an environmental antigen, an infectious antigen, the monocyte processes this and presents it to the T cell by taking it from a native antigen to a processed peptide which fits into a nice groove in a molecule on the surface of the cell called the class 2 MHC or IA molecule. Here again, this antigen receptor on the T cell recognizes this and with the CD4 molecule interdigitating with the class 2 molecule, you get a perfect fit. That's the reason why there are genetic control of immune responses because you have to have presentation of antigen in association with a molecule that is very, very specific for your genetic makeup. Now, what happens when there are proteins of the virus floating around? And again, we have proven this ourselves and other investigators have corroborated that, that the envelope protein of the virus, which has the ability, as I mentioned, to bind very avidly to the CD4 molecule, when that occurs, what you have is binding of this GP120 to the CD4 preventing the normal interdigitation of these molecules such that this cell now is incompetent to respond to the particular antigen that it's programmed to respond to. So not only do you have a quantitative diminution of cells, you actually have a qualitative functional abnormality. So there's double jeopardy for an individual who's infected with HIV. Now, about a year and a half ago, it became very clear to us working in the field that the monocytes were becoming major players in the HIV propagation. But in, again, to make things more complicated, unlike the T cell, monocytes were in some sense even more dangerous in their ability to get infected because the virus replicates within the monocyte, but it does it without killing the cell. So all of a sudden, you have the possibility of a reservoir for HIV infection and the capability of disseminating the virus to different parts of the body, such as the brain. Now, if you can recall, just a few moments ago, I showed you a picture of the virus exploding out of the T4 cell. The situation is different when you look at the monocyte. This is an electron micrograph of a monocyte that's infected. And rather than seeing any virions exploding out of the side, I've blown this up here on the side. You can see this is taken from here, that the virus is actually budding into the cell. As you can see here, these are virions that are budding into intracellular uh, vesicles within the cell. 
So you can have a tremendous amount of production of virions without necessarily having the body's immune system even recognize that you're infected. This is really very important. This is, again, a blow-up of that. And the reason it's important is that you're starting to hear a bit now about people who are infected who may have a six-month or a year interval before they become antibody positive. And it's felt now that the reason for that is that the body's ability to recognize the virus is masked by the fact that the virus can hide in these cells and not be recognized by the body's immune system. So when you have the virus budding into a cell, you can't expect the antibody-making component of the body to recognize that. That is going to have interesting implications in our ability to culture the virus from individuals, as well as in our ability to project individuals who are infected at a given time when they will ultimately develop disease or even be infective for other people. With regard to the brain, we know, again, from a number of studies, including studies from my own laboratory, that the primary cell in the brain that's infected with HIV is the monocyte macrophage. And it is very likely that that cell secretes products that are ultimately toxic to the brain because there's no evidence right now that the neurons in the brain or any neuronal tissue is directly infected with HIV. Yet we know clearly that there are major effects of the virus on human brain, ranging from asymptomatic infection to subtle cognitive and psychiatric abnormalities up through and including frank dementia and meningoencephalitis. It's really extraordinary, but we did a study at the NIH about a year and a half ago in which we were giving AZT to individuals with Kaposi sarcoma who had absolutely no neurological abnormalities. And in order to determine if AZT got into the cerebrospinal fluid, we did lumbar punctures on them every couple of weeks to do levels of AZT. And we found out that in these totally asymptomatic individuals with no indication of neuropsychiatric abnormalities, about 40% of them had HIV in the CSF, about 40% of them. In other words, these individuals have virus in the brain and they have absolutely no symptoms. So it's very easy for the virus to get into the brain. Now, with regard to latency and productivity, we know now that early in the course of infection, there are blips of antigenemia, which is part of the product of the virus, indicating that there's active viral replication. It generally disappears, and you have increase in antibody. And then at the end of the course, when individuals are far advanced, you have persistent antigenemia. But every once in a while, you have a blip of antigenemia, which is really unexplained. And to make a long story short, about a year ago, we set out to try and determine what causes these bursts of antigenemia. And getting back to the original slide which I showed you, we're going to concentrate now on what makes a cell go from a microbiologically latent to an actively productive cell. I've showed you the explosion of the virus before. And if you concentrate on this, we know from a number of studies that a variety of inductive signals can induce the expression of HIV. Mitogen stimulation, antigen stimulation, other viruses. You do this by inserting the genes of a virus into an HIV-infected cell. And most recently, we've demonstrated that physiological signals that you normally encounter in the normal immune response is capable of inducing the expression of virus. And again, rather than show you any data, let me schematically diagram this for you. What we've been able to recently show is that cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor, which is very actively produced, particularly when you have other opportunistic infections, has the capability of inducing a cellular gene which secretes a product which acts on this gene that I showed you before, this long terminal repeat, inducing the expression of virus so that you have increased HIV expression. Now, why is this important and why am I taking the time to tell you about it? It's important because what we feel is going on now are that individuals over a period of several years wind up having an insidious and progressive increase in the expression of virus, probably due to normal immunological signals that you encounter every single day of your life. In other words, the progression is inexorable. 
even though you don't necessarily get infected with another opportunistic infection, giving us more fuel for our quest of treating people early in the course of their disease rather than when they develop full-blown AIDS. Now, this just recapitulates some of the immunopathogenic mechanisms with the T4 lymphocyte and the monocyte infected. It can exist as a latent form or as an actively productive form. There are reservoirs of HIV infection. Inductive <laughs> signals can cause the expression of virus. If it's in a lymphocyte, you have loss of the cell, immunosuppression, and opportunistic infection. If it's in a monocyte, you can have release of factors that can cause brain disease and the neuropsychiatric manifestations. Let's move briefly on now to antiretroviral therapy and immunological reconstitution. The reason I showed you the life cycle of the virus before, because I want to get back to it now. This is a schematic diagram of the life cycle. Again, the virus attaches, you get reverse transcription, integration, transcription, and then new virions. At each and every one of the points in this life cycle, the virus is vulnerable to attack by an antiretroviral agent. And that's exactly how we're targeting our development of drugs right now. For example,